The conversation about Jesus' suffering and death is enclosed in a dazzling foreshadowing of the resurrection. God affirms Jesus' identity. The disciples are stunned speechless. And Jesus resumes his mission with a demonstration of his power over evil. A reading from Luke chapter 9. Now about day, eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings for you, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent in those days, told no, no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. I don't watch television very often. Eric and I don't have a television. But every once in a while, when I'm waiting in a doctor's office or dentist's office, I see someone on television sell a book about how to influence people. Usually it's so you can be a super salesman and sell anybody to, anything to anybody and make a million dollars. After all, learning how to, to make a million dollars ought to be worth 19.95, don't you think? Influencing people, getting them to do what we want, is a fantasy for many of us. We wonder what it would be like to hypnotize someone and get them to do things against their will, even though most of us understand that hypnosis doesn't work that way. We'd like to get Donald Trump to give us a million dollars, or if we're single, have that movie star fall in love with us. As we grow older, we learn how to influence people and even manipulate those we love. Kids influence adults by crying or throwing tantrums. Adults have influenced kids over the years by timeouts and by spankings. Adults influence each other by money, by talking, by violence, or sadly at times by withholding love and friendship. Even as adults, we sometimes say, I want it my way, or I'll pick up my toys and go home. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be God? It would really be difficult. How should God influence us? Here's God, infinite power. God created us after all, and God can influence, influence us in any way possible. Jesus could have done a million things to prove that he was God. 
and have a world of followers at his beck and call. But he didn't. He did miracles, yes, but for the most part he tried to keep them secret. He kept miracles secret for a good reason. Jesus knew the power of miracles to influence people. Even today, all God would have to do to get a million, a billion followers on Facebook is a tiny miracle. God could simply make a small lake like Placid Lake nearby instantly and then tell people about it. So why not? Why not do a miracle and everyone believe in the name of God? Well, there's a little problem, a problem of free will and choice. If God overwhelmed us with a miracle, we might be afraid not to believe in God. But instead, God wants us to believe in Jesus because he loves us. If we are afraid of God, we may feel we have to believe in Jesus. We may fear God's power like a gun stuck in your face. But God wants us to make sure that we believe not because we're forced to, but because we want to. I believe that's why Jesus appeared the glorious way he did today to only three people. Well, five, counting Moses and Elijah. He was afraid people would follow him for the wrong reason. In today's lesson, Jesus didn't even take all the disciples up the mountain, only the three that he was closest to, Peter, James, and John. Perhaps those are the only ones he could truly trust with knowing who he was. He warned even the three, his closest friends, not to tell anyone about the transformation until after he had gone. Even for the three who knew Jesus was God, the experience on the mountain was amazing. It reduced people to babbling, Peter to dab, babbling some nonsense about making tents for dead people. Luke doesn't record how the other two, James and John, reacted, but I can imagine. My guess, my best guess, is they were speechless with shock. It's one thing to know that Jesus had a special relationship with God the Father. It would be another thing to see the sheer wonder of Jesus in blinding, splendid light. In a moment they saw Jesus, the man they knew, in a new and glorious perspective. The ordinary, living with Jesus for years, had become extraordinary. A change in perspective it can happen in a lot of ways. Every so often, someone tells me about an experience they've had that thrills them. An experience where in the same way, the ordinary is transformed for a moment into the extraordinary. People who could lift the Rockies or stand on the edge of a grand, the Grand Canyon are awestruck by their out of the ordinary majesty. But this kind of experience can happen anywhere. You can be awestruck when you look at the exquisite beauty of a daffodil, the swirling of a field of ripening grain in the wind, a bird soaring in the sky, wheeling about, or even a leaf on a lake. Scientists, artists, ordinary folk, it makes no difference who you are. It can happen to any of us. Blaise Pascal was a philosopher. He was known for a lot of deep learning. He was known to be a man of quiet emotions, rarely stoic most of the time. And so, when he died, that's what they thought who he was. But, as it turned out, somehow they were able to, when they were examining his clothes, they found that he had something that was sewn in the lining of his coat. And in the lining of his coat was a date on a piece of paper. And under that date was fire. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, not the God of philosophers. 
Blaise Pascal had had an experience of God that was extraordinary. But he was so afraid of mentioning it to people that he kept it in his heart. But he kept it in his coat also to remind him of that experience every day of his life. When we have those experiences, and they do happen in much the same way for many of us, I have no way of knowing how many of you have had such experiences, either the simple ones where you see the beauty and the glory of God, or where you see the fire that Blaise Pascal had. No matter which experience it is, what type, when we have those experiences, just for a moment we can see the handprint and handiwork of God. We see wonder and beauty and simplicity and it fills us with awe. When did you last see something like that? When have you last experienced something like that? There are no ordinary things in nature for God made them. These glimpses of life beyond ourselves fill us with awe but they teach us why we seldom have experiences of God one-on-one. -on -one. God knows better. If even the handiwork of God can awe us, if even the image of God can amaze us, what about the disciples', disciples experience today? What about the experience of Blaise Pascal? More direct experiences of God can literally blow us away. Moses' face was shining so brightly after seeing God that he had to wear a veil when he met people. I've been blessed to see that look, the look of God and the face of a few people. And each time I do, words fail me. Now the people's faces I saw were not literally shining, not like the faces of Jesus and Moses were, but they still reflected God's glory in an extraordinary way. I simply cannot describe to you how filled with the Spirit, how glorious these people's faces were. I've had similar experiences. Some of you have heard the, the story about my first church, how difficult it was. This was a church where four of the previous five pastors who had served the church went out of the ministry after they served the church. This was a church where one pastor was caught in the, in his, with his pants down in the church office with a member of the congregation, where a pastor did not show up for church on Sunday morning. They went next door to the parsonage, and they found him literally in the closet of the parsonage, would not come out. This was a church where a man who had been a bipolar pastor, who had been out of a bipolar, went out of control, always there, and his wife had a major stroke. So this was not an easy church. And I, I struggled with that church. But one night, I remember I was praying, and I had much the same sort of experience with, uh, with that as uh, Moses and Elijah and uh, Jesus and the disciples did. And my heart, in the words of John Wesley, when he had such an experience, was strangely warmed. It felt wonderful. I felt more at peace than it had ever been before. All kinds of unusual things happened to me for the next week or two afterwards. One of them, I remember, was praying in my office one day for someone in the congregation who had pneumonia. I felt like a, an urge to call her, to go over to her house and pray for her. And so I did. I did it by myself. Now that was my first church. I would not do that again. I would not go over to a woman's house about my same age without somebody along with me. But went I did. And it, when I got there, she seemed surprised to see me. So I prayed with her. And uh, she had a bad case of pneumonia. She'd been there for about three weeks at home. And then I left. 
and she got better. Well, about a month later, she was uh, talking to me and said, you know, when that day that you called me, I was sitting in my house and I was despairing because not only did I have pneumonia, not only was I very sick, but my husband was having an affair. And I remember praying, oh God, just let me die. I don't care anymore. It doesn't matter. It was at that moment, it was at that moment that she got my phone call. Those are the kind of things that happen if we're connected to God. Now, I would wish that that kind of experience with God would happen all the time, but it doesn't. I would wish that we could all be strangely warmed in that way, that God would keep us in such a way that we would never feel any anxiety about life. But life doesn't work that way. I believe God gives such experiences for a reason. I believe that uh, in my case, it was uh, one of those cases where all hell was about to break loose in that congregation. That was a case where the church secretary was having an affair with one of the elders. Half the congregation was saying, do something, pastor, you've got to do something. The other half of the congregation was saying, don't touch it, pastor, leave it alone. So here I was. Damned if I do, and damned if I didn't. I believe that God gave the experience that Peter and James and John had for a reason also. They were gifts from God for three men who needed them desperately. Just as my gift was, I believe, to get me through the difficult times that followed. Not to persuade them of God's existence. The disciples knew that God existed, just like I did, just like Blaise Pastel did. Rather, I believe their experiences of God prepared them for trials and tribulations to come. Peter, James, and John had Maundy Thursday and Good Friday ahead. They needed extra assurance of who God was to see them through those dark days. To have an awesome encounter with God can help you to hang in there when life gets rough. There are some who believe that after an encounter with God like today, your relationship with God remains perfect and you are transformed into a perfect saint. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that that never happens. Um, saint Teresa of Avila had such an experience, and we do call her a saint because she was sainted before the Catholic Church split off from the Protestant Church, so we still honor those people who were sainted before when they were, when we were a time when we were part of the Catholic Church. In any case, Teresa... Her heart was warmed her entire life. That doesn't happen very often. Most of the time, it happens in a different way. God won't let a mountaintop experience take us that far. That would be more heaven than we can really expect in this world. The vast majority of us all have to come down off the mountain and face reality just as Peter and James and John did. We might have the most glorious experience in worship Sunday morning, in singing, in praising, talking to folks we know, but we still have an experience of Monday morning and Tuesday and the storms that might hit. And in time, quite honestly, even for those who have such experiences of God, whether small ones or large ones, we return to our formal selves to a certain extent. We mess up again. Moses messed up after he saw God, and he was punished by never getting into the promised land. Not long after his mountain vision of Jesus, Peter denied three times that he even knew him. During an experience of God, everything can seem perfect. But that moment of God's power fades for most of us. Not long after P 
Peter, James, and John came down off the mountain, they deserted Jesus, at least temporarily. There's no getting away from the trials and mistakes of this world even after we catch a glimpse of heaven. God doesn't design the world that way. That's why the churches have believed that if you trust God and everything is perfect, those are dangerous churches in a way. There is no gospel that means that, that once you believe in God that everything is going to be wonderful. Inside, sometimes. Outside, ourselves, almost never. There's simply no getting away from the trials and mistakes of this world, even after we catch a glimpse of heaven. But it becomes easier to trust in God, and it's all part of the learning process that we have in this life. Seeing God in a daffodil, or a tree, or a person, or in a blinding light, a fire, can't change our whole character. We remain sinners. God won't allow mountain top experiences to make us perfect people. We weren't meant to be carried by God completely in this lifetime. In this life, to grow, we have to struggle at times. What are mountain top experiences good for then? Well, they can leave us with a lasting impression of who God is and what heaven will be like. They can help us through life's hard times to remember that God is with us, God loves us, even when we do screw up. And sometimes a brief glimpse of a distant goal on a journey is all you need to make it there, though the road may be hard. May it be so with our journey to